Hi, I'm Aiden Mirzai, CEO at Fellow.app, and I'm ready to start digging deep. I'm Mark Sutcliffe, and I'm on a quest to learn from the best. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with really interesting, thoughtful, accomplished people in many different fields. On this episode, tales and lessons from a quintessential entrepreneur, Aidan Mirzai. Now, there are many people who stumble into entrepreneurship. They didn't plan it that way, but Aidan Mirzai has wanted to be an entrepreneur for as long as he can remember. He read books about business and biographies when he was a teenager living in New York City. And then, when he was just 22 years old, just out of university, he co-founded the survey company Fluidware, which was later sold to industry giant SurveyMonkey. Aiden's latest venture is a company called Fellow App, which is about solving the eternal problem of making team meetings better and more effective. Our conversation today covers a lot of ground. We talk about some of Aiden's experiences as a serial entrepreneur, like starting Fluidware from a two-bedroom apartment. Aiden shares what he learned from working with his co-founder, the veteran entrepreneur Eli Fati. We talk about some of Aiden's rules for business. Here's one of them. No agenda, no meeting. I love that one. Why startups should focus on only one product. That's an interesting angle. We talk about learning from other people, about Aiden working with his brother, which he's done since the very beginning of his career. We talk about staying close to your customers and how you should find a great idea and develop a passion for it rather than what everybody tells you to do, which is follow your passion. And Aiden shares how he managed to go to university without finishing high school, what it was like selling his company and then discovering he really had no life outside it. Why entrepreneurship is about getting a lot of at-bats. I really like that lesson. And we talk about why starting a business is, let's face it, a statistically bad idea, which leads to the secret to Aiden's success. It's irrational optimism. Now, one last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to Digging Deep and post a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And Share the podcast with your network. We want as many people to hear it as possible. And if you're looking for more information on the podcast, please go to letsdigdeep.com. There's lots of great stuff there for you. Blog, weekly newsletter, and more. Letsdigdeep.com. Now, let's start digging deep with lifelong entrepreneur Aiden Mirzai. Hayden, it's such a pleasure to welcome you to Digging Deep. Uh, to me, you are the personification of a serial entrepreneur, and I've had many great conversations with you in the past about some of the work that you've done and the experiences you've had and the lessons you've learned, so I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, yeah I've been looking forward to it. It should be fun. So let's start by going back in time a little bit. And Aiden, what would you say is your fondest childhood memory? Ha. <laughs> so it depends on like what, what we classify as childhood. But uh, I don't know. Like I, I, I would say that, you know, my fondest childhood, I mean, there, there, there are a few. Um, but I would say that like what led me to the, the path, uh, of entrepreneurship and, and you're going to laugh at this cause I grew up in New York city. Uh, right. So I grew up in New York city, but my, my foray into business was, um, my brother and I wanted to buy this really expensive basketball, you know, expensive for, you know, for kids who are, you know, like I was maybe 12 and, and like he was nine or something. Um, and so we, uh, you know, so we, we decided like we'd, we'd find a job. And so we obviously no, no one hires people that age. So we started uh, shoveling snow, like going door to door in New York uh, and then like just getting them to allow. And, uh, and we just had a bad business strategy. Our business strategy was 
you know, we're going to cost less than everybody else. That's not a great, we'll do the whole driveway for $5. It was, you know, uh, but it was, but it was really good. I, I, you know, we learned a lot then uh, through, through that experience. And that was like my brother and I for the first time ever teaming up to do anything business related. And then we just, you know, ended up doing like a series of things after that. But, you know, I always laugh at that because, uh, I mean, New York doesn't even get a lot of snow relatively. Uh, so anyways, that it was just an interesting, uh, first thing that popped to my head when you said that. And of course you ended up working with your brother a lot. So, uh, well, that was the, that was the genesis of that. Oh yeah, we did a lot. Yeah. We basically, I mean, since, you know, then we've basically nonstop been working together. So it's been a long time now. Yeah. More than 20 years. Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? Oh yeah. I mean, when, when I was 10 years old, um, yeah, I probably, I don't know, like who was in the news at that time. I probably looked up a lot to, um, I would say, you know, we we were into computers and like, you know, building things. And so we probably looked up, uh, to Bill Gates and and thought he was pretty cool at the time. Okay. What did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far back as I can remember, I, yeah, we were going to build companies like that was the, I mean, the other part of the childhood memory was, uh, I, you know, not to turn this into a super long story, but basically uh, what happened was we, you know, we wanted to like go in and, and, and find work. And like when we couldn't find work, what we did was we uh, figured out that you could, um, I had a friend who, who was like really into stock trading and, and things like that. So uh, after my brother and I kind of gave up on uh, being able to find a job and like it's summertime and there's no school, uh, so we couldn't shovel snow anymore. Uh, so we got this idea that we should take all of our snow shoveling proceeds uh, and create like have our dad create an account uh, for us uh, so we could start day trading and like just doing stock market related things. Um, but what was interesting about that experience was, um, a, it was like boom time. So, you know, you didn't really, like everybody was making money until like nobody was making money. Uh, so that was interesting. But what I liked the most was we literally would spend our summers watching, you know, CNBC or MSNBC or whatever we were watching at that time. Uh, and then we'd see like all of these, you know, people again, like this is like, I don't know if it was 1999 or 2000 or, or whatever it was. And we were watching like all these entrepreneurs build companies and, and go public. And then like, we would buy their stock and trade their stock. And so, uh, you know, from that time, I just had this obsession of like, what are these like entrepreneurs doing and building these businesses and, uh, and yeah. And then I, I thought that like, maybe one day when we grow up, we could do that. Uh, and then other wow. people can buy our stock. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, as far back as I can remember, we've just been starting companies and just, you know, really like enjoy business in general, like just the, just everything about it. it doesn't even matter what the company is. We just like business. Wow. That's so cool. Uh, we're going to come back to that. Uh, what would you say is your life story in six words? Ha, in six words. Um, build things, create value, enjoy the journey. I use seven, but <laughs> <laughs> one of them's the, so that's okay. Yeah. What is a big mistake you've made along the way and what did you learn from it? Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's interesting, right? Like just the, the concept of, uh, you know, what, what are mistakes and, and, and should you have done them or, or repeat them? Um, but I don't know. Like one of the mistakes maybe is, you know, if I were to think back to my last business, uh, we, we somehow convinced ourselves that it was a good idea to have two products. And that was probably in retrospect, not a good idea. Now it had a good outcome, uh, but it was, it was not a good idea. And I I feel like we might've had a significantly better outcome had we not done that. If you just focused on one. Just one product. Startups right. shouldn't have more than one product. Startups shouldn't have more than one product. That's that's an interesting lesson. For what do you feel most grateful? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, well, I mean, you know, beyond the obvious, like family and 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 kids and 
uh, yeah, just even the, the process of having kids just like really changes your perspective on what's actually valuable. Uh, so yeah, and I, you, I would and you say just that. had your third child, right? So yeah, we just had our, yeah. So now we're, now we're about, you know, we're, we're a family of five, which is, which is a lot. It's crazy. Yeah. The other day, I, I, you know, I was thinking like when we go, whenever it's possible to go, go to other people's houses, we're going to say all five of us are coming. And that just seems like such a large number. Yeah. Uh, well, it's so, funny yeah, you say that because I, uh, there's five in our family and, and um, it's, it's not an easy number. Like the, a lot of the world is designed for families of four hotel rooms. Uh, you know, if you book a cruise, um, you know, a lot of travel experiences that you add that fifth person and it changes a lot of things. I'll warn you, uh, cause you end up with, you know, needing an extra room sometimes or needing an extra bed where there isn't one. And you oh, know, I haven't that experienced that stuff yet. Yeah, Get ready for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's you know, even table for five in the restaurant. Oh, not, you know, like a, a lot of the tables are for four, you know? So anyway, yeah. But I mean, you know, it, 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 you know, it, it's for sure like that tops the list. Um, you know, the other things I would say, I mean, there's a lot to be grateful for. And like a lot of things that ha have happened for me that, that, you know, have just been really lucky. Right. Like ending up in Canada was was a really lucky thing for me um, in my last company. Uh, co-founding a company with someone who was like 33 years older than I was, who was like effectively like mentor and co-founder in one. I feel like that was insanely lucky and uh, super grateful for that. Uh, you know, having, you know, parents that like, you know, encouraged me to like not have low standards and like work really hard and uh, and always being there and making sacrifices and so on and so forth. So, you know, I, I could, you know, spend the whole podcast talking about ways I got lucky or, or things that I'm uh, grateful for. But yeah, it's uh, you have to be lucky. Like you, you know, this is one totally of the things agree. it doesn't, you know, it, it, it hard work doesn't do it alone. That's for yeah, sure. Totally agree. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, that's really powerful. So what has been the best year of your life so far and why? Um, yeah, I, you know, I would say like, I, I like to always have the framing that the best year is yet to come. Uh, sure. so I, I don't like conceptually this concept that like, there could be a year that was the best, which means that like, it's downhill from there. I refuse well, to I did believe say so that, far. Yeah. I refuse. Yeah. I, I, like, I still always like to think that the peak is, uh, you know, ahead, but, um, I don't know. Like there, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of great years. Um, you know, to be honest, like I can't necessarily single one out to say like one has been the best. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that 2020 with COVID has, you know, has been a crappy year, but I think like we share that sentiment with a lot of people, but, uh, yeah, honestly, I, I probably wouldn't single any, any year out. Like every year has been super special in, in, in its own way. Is there a year that's been the toughest year of your life so far? Yes. Uh, the, the, the first two years of any startup are particularly grueling. I will say that. Okay. So you've, you've had a couple of rounds of that. Yeah. Every, yeah. every new startup the first year is grueling. What one person has had the greatest impact on your life? Yeah. I mean, again, like a lot of this, uh, I can't not give uh, a lot of credit, um, you know, to, to both of my, my parents, uh, have learned different things, uh, from both of them, but, you know, I would also, uh, put on their like outside of family, which is maybe cheating, uh, I, I would also say that, you know, Ellie, uh, Fatty, my, uh, co-founder at, at fluid uh, ha has also been super impactful. I mean, uh, more on the business side of things, but yeah, he's definitely, uh, been a person I've learned a lot from. What's the most important lesson you've learned that you would share with other people? Um, I would say be irrationally optimistic. Be irrationally optimistic. Yeah. Not just optimistic, but irrationally optimistic. Yeah. Like it shouldn't make sense why you're optimistic in that certain point. Like it's just, you know, you can't logic it, but you just, 
you know, somehow uh, you, you find a way to be optimistic, even though all rash, yeah, any rational person would tell you that you shouldn't be. Okay. What would people be most surprised to learn about you? Uh, most surprised. I mean, I'm, I, I'm very quirky in a lot of ways, but, uh, I, I don't know what would be most surprising. Uh, some things that people might not know about me is, um, you know, I, uh, I never finished high school. Uh, I did go to university though. So it's kind of a long story, but, uh, I, yeah, I, I didn't officially finish high school. Uh, that, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I'm pretty like particular. I know you. Uh, I know you do a lot of running too. We we've we've talked about this. Yep. Uh, We're both runners. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I mean, you're way faster than I am for I sure. I don't know about that. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but but the uh, I don't know. Like I I work out um, pretty much every every single day of the year, uh, and uh, yeah, e- even on like Christmas Day, I remember like the, like the gym will be closed and then I'll go to, you know, a hotel, uh, and like pay to use the, the gym there. I'm, I'm pretty religious about like, I can't really start my day without like my, my exercise. I, I'm not saying I'm the world's most fittest person, but it's just like, it's just part of root, my routine. And I take routine pretty seriously. Yeah. What is your boldest prediction for the future? Yeah, I think, yeah. So what I would say is that uh, we're going to get to a point uh, where despite what everybody talks about, which is like in-person meetings and in-person interactions are very special. I do agree. They are very special. Um, And it doesn't, you know, based on where we are today, it doesn't seem like uh, we would ever want to like, you know, favor a non-in-person meeting to, um, a, a virtual meeting of sorts, but I think like over the course of t- time, technology will get so good that an in-person experience or an in-person meeting will actually be subpar uh, to what a virtual one could look like, uh, especially as it relates to, you know, business uh, interactions or, um, you know, I, I think like the technology landscape will make it so that like, yeah, just remote and uh, remote meetings or virtual meetings will actually be better than in-person ones. Wow. There's already such a much larger appetite for that now, I think, than there was a year ago, right? So it's like yeah, the I whole think world in a decade, has been conditioned. We're gonna, totally. I think in a decade, we look back at this and um, and and we're going to say, yeah, we, like the technology will be radically different. Mm. Yeah, we're just at the beginning, right? Um what would be the message of your commencement address if you were speaking to a group of students today? Yeah, if I were to, I mean, again, like I, I would say just be irrationally optimistic and, uh, and dream big. What's been a recent epiphany for you? Is there some new discovery you've made or something you've, about which you've changed your mind? Yes. <laughs> I mean, is, I wouldn't say I, 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 I changed my mind. Um, but. I don't know, through, through working with, with an uh, executive coach, I've learned a lot about my very many flaws uh, and like, but also my, my ways of thinking. And, and, and I haven't realized like how many almost like um, ways of thinking have been embedded um, in me because I've been doing things a certain way for, for so long. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it's just really interesting how like everybody again, like have these, has, have, have these norms and like habits and way of doing things. And, and you don't necessarily even realize that. Um, but yeah, I, I've just realized that, uh, it, it's really good to do that kind of introspection, uh, to really figure out how, how you'll grow and, and go to the next level. Can you, is there, is there an example of that that you could provide of, I know exactly what you mean about how you, you sort of, you have these patterns of behavior and these ways of approaching things that you think um, you don't even notice they're there, right? Until they're brought to your attention. You you don't even notice that you're, you have a filter or you have a, a you've layered some, some of your own kind of uh, um, approach on top of something, right? 
Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, a, a simple example is, uh, as, you know, as my last company was a bootstrap startup, uh, which meant that, you know, like we were really scrappy, like really scrappy. Um, and so a lot of, um, you know, I would do all the things that, you know, uh, you, you, you could argue a CEO shouldn't do for, for long term. But, you know, for example, I was, uh, I would do customer support um, on top of everything else. But then once we had enough money to hire a customer support person, I was customer support from like 5 p.m. until midnight. Um, and then like we hired someone who could do like the ladder shift. And so I was customer support on weekends. Um, and it, you know, and, and so anyway, so, so some of that you could argue was necessary at the time, although you could, you know, argue against that too. And that was just like, not smart. Uh, but, uh, I don't know, like that kind of like, uh, scrappy behavior and just like that way of thinking is, um, you know, you did it for so long, but also in, in a very highly intense period. Right. And so then you run into, let's run a venture back startup and like the dynamics are different. So you can't use the same decision-making framework and like just the same way of doing things. Uh, and it just actually requires you to think differently. Uh, but if you don't actively think about it, you'll just do things, uh, in the way that you used to. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that's a, that's an easier example. Uh, yeah. so but yeah. you're saying if, if, if it's some, if going back, I don't know, whatever, 10 years or something, if, if, if somebody had an issue and they called customer support at fluid where they would have gotten you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and Weekends, they would have been nights. talking to the founder of the company and they, they would have thought it was just some guy in the it department. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, like that's really good, especially in the early well, stages sure. of a company. And like even yeah. later stages, you should do a little bit of that anyway. Like the further you are from the customer, the worse off your decision making is going to be. But like I took it to the extreme. Yeah. Well, Probably there's a difference that. between that being like one of the ways that you get information and it and it the the entire company relying on you doing that shift every day. Right? Yeah. And and by the way, like I should, yes, exactly. And and so let me and and the reason it's bad is because like sure let's pretend you're superhuman and you can do that and do your like what you're actually supposed to do and like what a ceo of a company is actually supposed to do let's say that you can do both of those magically really well but if one takes away from your time of doing the other one and like you're not doing and you know other things in the company are breaking cuz you're not having the time or you're being a bottleneck now yeah. you're in you know now you're doing the wrong thing and so, yeah, that, that, that's how to think yeah. about it. Yeah. I can't put the prospectus together for the next round of investment. Cause I've got to sit at the customer support desk for the next eight hours. That's yeah. Not or a, I didn't reply like... to that email from that investor because we had another, you know, so yeah, uh, yeah I, I yeah. think it's, uh, but yeah, it's just like the framing of, uh, of how you approach things. And, and you'd be surprised, like, uh, you know, a very basic example. It was so funny. I was listening to this podcast, um, and the CEO of Atlassian uh, was on. And just to show you like how habits go around, he's like, I, you know, I rented a car and, you know, I had to, um, I realized that like I, I had the option of, you know, returning the car and like paying the extra fee for the gas or I could go do a detour of 20 minutes and like fill up myself. And I'd probably like spend, you know, $8 extra if I just you know, and it is, a, and, and even in those cases, like your default behavior might be, let's go fill up the car. Uh, but then if, yeah. if you, if you think about it under different circumstances, that might not be the right decision. So it's just like things like that, like your default behaviors and questioning that basically what it comes down to is I think that every person, myself included once every five years should like, look up, look around and say, okay, the world is different. Circumstances are different because the world changes rapidly. Am I still like, you know, operating based on decisions and things that like, or shortcuts and heuristics that I formed based on information that is now five years old, right? Exactly. Um, or 10 years old. And right? circumstances and, and think, that have changed and, and yeah, reality. Yeah, so changed. I think yeah. like, this is a, just a yeah. you know, thing that like, it, it, it's useful to, to ask those sorts of questions. Very useful. 
I, I listened to the same podcast that you did. It was oh, awesome. How I, how I Built This with the, yeah, two, with the two founders this. of Atlassian, this giant software corporation. And I had exactly the same reaction because I probably make all kinds of stupid, small financial decisions based on my financial circumstances of 10 years ago or 20 years ago instead of my financial circumstances today, which doesn't mean I should waste money, but it means that I shouldn't worry so much about the little things the way I used to when I had very little money, right? So yeah, just, and you know, it, it relates example. to the company as well, right? Like it's yeah. just, you know, going back to the, if you're a bootstrap startup or now you're a venture back startup, you have to make decisions differently. So, yep. so that's what it yep. comes down to. Is there a book, Aiden, that has had a big impact on you that you're most likely to recommend to other people? Uh, yeah, so I I really like, uh, you know, un unsurprisingly, maybe uh, business biographies uh, really enjoy stories of entrepreneurs who, who've created other companies. I'm sure you've read it, but like the, the best one that I would recommend to anyone um, is uh, Shoe Dog, uh, which is the story of Nike by Phil Knight. Uh, incredible book. So good. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I would say that I'd put that at the at the top of my list. All right. Well, Aiden, already so many great points have come up. Uh, the things I want to pursue even further as we get into a deeper discussion here. Thank you for answering those questions. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to continue digging deep with Aiden Mirzai. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks.ca. Dot CA. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, 
Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. Aiden, this has already been uh, such an informative discussion. There's so much I want to explore further, but I, I want to get into your backstory a little bit because you mentioned that coming to Canada was a stroke of luck for you. Can you just kind of go back to, you know, where you were born, uh, how you ended up here, what that whole journey was like? Because uh, I know, I know it, it's an interesting tale. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a little, it's, it's a little like roundabout, but yeah, no, I, I, you know, I'm actually, so I'm, I'm Persian by background. Um, but I was, uh, funny enough, born in India, um, because my parents, uh, traveled a lot and, uh, and then I, I, you know, I grew up in the, in, in the U S like my, my dad, um, you know, worked for, uh, for, for the United Nations for, for many years. And, uh, you know, it, it was interesting, like he was going to travel and, uh, go to the Netherlands, um, you know, for, for work. And, and I, I was right around the, the age where I was going to choose where to go to university. And, uh, the, the reason like Canada came up was I, I just had family, in Canada and, and specifically Ottawa. And yeah, so I applied to the University of Ottawa because, you know, Ottawa, University of Ottawa, that <laughs> kind of made sense. And, and that's how I ended up here. But yeah, all that to say is like, you know, it, it's just, it, it's lucky, you know, being um, in a place where the sorts of things that I've done are actually possible, right? Like that you could actually come in here, go to school, like, I came to Canada when I was 17. Now, again, like I grew up in North America, so I spoke the language and, you know, all, all this fun stuff, but uh, being able to, to start a company straight out of school and, uh, you know, being a in a place where things like that are possible and it's like easy to do and like there's, you know, the resources. I mean, those are not, um, you know, th th that could have ended up very differently, right? So if mm -hmm. I you know, maybe, maybe that wouldn't have been the case if I say grew up in Iran, that might've been uh, a very different story. So yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, super glad that, uh, you know, came here and, um, yeah, really love Canada and, and Ottawa. And, and I think that's, that's been important. So you talked about how, when you and your brother were kids, you were really into this idea of building companies. And, and if you were to, if you were to remove some of the language that was specific to entrepreneurship and the shows you were watching, you know, the way you were describing it, it was almost like some other kid talking about wanting to be a professional baseball player or basketball player and watching games on TV and wanting to be like those people. Like, that's what it sounds like when you were kids, you were fixated on, business stars rather than sports stars or music stars and you wanted to be like them why was that your fascination how did what do you think the source of that was yeah and you know i'll have to let my brother speak for himself uh, so maybe i was a little bit more obsessed and then you know i just uh i just uh convinced him that it, you know it, it was a good idea and and he should support me uh but um, I, I don't know, like, I, again, like it wasn't a, it, it was just like one thing led to another, right? Like it was the, the snow shoveling thing, which made me think, whoa, this is really cool. We could do this. And then like, we could, you know, um, you know, buy the things that we wanted, you know, as a 12 year old wanting to buy a basketball, that was pretty cool at the time. Uh, and then it was, you know, we got involved in, in the stock trading thing and it just opened my eye and, you know, you, this is New York, right? Like this is New York city. And so, you just, I mean, you're going to come across, you know, Wall Street and, and, and these notions. And so um, I went to school with other kids who may have had parents working in Wall Street. And so that led to that. And, and then it was just, and then again, like through watching TV, then you would get exposed to these entrepreneurs. And then I'd start reading biographies. I think like, you know, I read maybe, again, this is New York. So I read Michael Bloomberg's biography, maybe when I was like 13. And then 
Uh, and then, you know, just, uh, yeah, just like kept going on, on, on these, on, on this track. And it was just like such an interesting concept to me, uh, that people could do this thing and like, uh, build companies and then other people could buy their products and, and it would just become part of the, um, yeah, it would just become part of people's lives. Uh, so it, it was just super interesting to me. And, uh, I just, uh, for whatever reason, got very obsessed uh, at a very young age and, and just wanted to, uh, yeah, continue. I, I can't tell you why I got like super interested in it, um, but it, it was just very interesting. But, you know, a lot of people, it's interesting because I've had this conversation with others where, you know, it's like, oh, you had an entrepreneur in the family or like there was someone. Uh, but for us, it was like, literally, we were watching TV and we're like, ha, huh, I wonder if we could do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and that, that's kind of when it started. And then like, it's, it's basically, I don't know, like I thought that we were almost um, getting away. Like, I wonder if we could do that. Like, I wonder if we could get away with, I remember this one time, for example, uh, one of the first businesses that we started was, so my brother is definitely the technical genius in, in the family, right? So uh, I, uh, you know, at an early age discovered that he was just way better, uh, than I was. And, and so I let him do more of that. And then I focused on, on the other things, but, you know, at a very young age, like we just, he started like building websites. Uh, and this is back when, you know, when there was like Yahoo chat, um, and things like that. And so I was like, I wonder if like we could build websites for other people, um, and you know, like we're, we're very young. So my idea of that was like, we would go into these Yahoo chat rooms and like, I would copy and paste the, Hey, does anyone need that uh, students like college students? And, you know, obviously we were not college students, but like, does anyone need college students to build a website for them? And I would like go, you know, for hours on end doing this until like the first person actually said, Oh, I'm an artist out of like, I forget what state. And like, can I give you a call now? And I just remember that uh, process. We're like, holy shit, she's actually going to call us. And so, uh, and then it was just like pretending that we were, you know, older than we were and that we were college students and we're just doing this on the side. Um, and then like when that worked, it just unlocked the next thing. It's like, I wonder if like this will work. And wow, it's just one thing led to another. And yeah. it, it's just, uh, it's just like, That's we're like, I wonder story. how far we could take this. And it, yeah. it was just really interesting. That's amazing. So uh, just before we move on with your entrepreneurial journey, you mentioned you didn't finish high school, but you did go to university. So, so how did that happen? Um, yeah, so there was, um, uh, there's, there's kind of a, a loophole, uh, ish in the system, but like you could basically, uh, under certain circumstances, like you could, um, you could basically, uh, take a high school equivalency exam. Um, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> so it was just, uh, yeah. So that, that, that that's what I did. Yeah. I dropped so you, out. You kind of prove your, exam. your, you prove your, your university worthy without the, without the high school diploma, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you won't get into Harvard, uh, doing that. Uh, but, but you yeah. can get into the university of Ottawa but, apparently, but you can, <laughs> well, actually, yeah. so I don't know. Um, Maybe, but it's, uh, I mean, there, there, there was a path, right? Like yeah. you do that and then you go to an, another college, uh, get good grades there and then, uh, and then you can transfer. Right. So is it true that you started Fluidware from a two bedroom apartment? Is that, is that the case? Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, you know, it was a two bedroom apartment. Uh, again, just going back to like being uh, super scrappy. So I had a roommate in this two bedroom apartment. And so my, my other two co-founders, Amin and Sam, uh, you know, there, there were students in the beginning of this, but you know, they'd come over like, especially in this, like, I think it might've been a summer when we started the company. And so they, they would come over. And so there's like four of us living in this two bedroom apartment. Uh, so we would take turns on who gets to sleep on the bed. Uh, so it, it was definitely one of those, uh, very, again, like very, very sort of scrappy, uh, you know, starts to that business, but yeah, it, it was really fun. We did, we did some fun things like that. And why that space, what attracted you to the, the area of online surveys? What was the process by which you ended up in there? 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Nobody, nobody wakes up wanting to build an online survey company. Uh, so it was definitely a story of many pivots. So we ended up there. It wasn't because we wanted to or had a passion for surveys. Again, so my thing was like, I was just passionate about business. And like, we could have started any company whatsoever. And I would have been equally excited uh, to do it. Um, and it was just, it was just like a story of like many pivots, how, how, how we, we, we got into that. It was really like, we started with an idea, it was no good. And then we kept asking, and then we just realized that, um, you know, what would people pay for and like, what are their needs? And we just kept digging and digging and digging and, and somehow we ended up in surveys. Uh, but yeah, certainly that was not the plan. Uh, I have no particular passion for surveys. Uh, but it, again, it, it was just the business of it. And, and for you to be successful in business, then you need to become obsessed about whatever it was. And, and then we did become obsessed about surveys and customer opinion and, and things like that, but certainly did not start that way. Yeah. And is there a lesson in that? Cause I've, I've heard some people talking recently about the whole idea of how follow your passion, which is a message that, that young people are given often is a little bit off the mark and how you have to develop a passion. You have to kind of identify a need in the marketplace, spend some time in that area, and then become passionate about it rather than start out with a passion and just pursue it relentlessly. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think so. I think I have it right, but there's this book um, called, um, and I, I've gifted this a bunch of times, but uh be so good they can't ignore you. I think is the is the title. Okay. Uh, it's a Cal Newport book. But basically, yeah, they go against this myth of going after your passion, um, right? Which is, yeah, I, I I also disagree with it. Like, how could you possibly know what your passion is unless you've experienced a whole bunch of different things? Um, I know that, like, you know, there's probably all sorts of things that I could be more passionate about. Uh, in in a few more years, but I just haven't experienced those things. So it's, uh, I don't know, I think you, you'll be in a good spot if you can say I can get passionate about anything, because there's always something to get passionate about for any topic. Right. And yeah. uh, I, I think if you come from that framing, it's just, um, but you can be passionate about having an impact or delivering results or, you know, playing an important role. I, I think those things are super important too. So good they can't ignore you. Why skills trump passion in the quest for work you love by Cal. Yeah, Newport. all young folks coming out of school should read that. Hundred okay. percent. Right on. So um, I want to talk for a moment about your relationship with Ellie Fati, who is a legend in the technology world in Ottawa and beyond. Um, uh, and you mentioned, you know, you you co-founded a company with somebody who was old enough to be your dad was twice your age. Actually, basically. He is my dad's age, which is really funny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so <laughs> literally old enough to be your dad. And that's not uh, the normal story, right? The normal story is two guys out of university, you know, decide to launch a company together. They're almost exactly the same age or, or someone starts a company and meets somebody else and, you know, they hit it off and whatever. So I'm really curious about that relationship and, and it obviously worked and there was, there were obviously great benefits to that relationship. So can you talk more about that? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's a lot of things. I just think that like, it's, it's interesting, even though we're, uh, obviously like age wise, uh, wide apart, but I feel like we're the same person in a lot of ways as it relates to, um, you know, just like, uh, it's just a bunch of like, I, I guess, characteristics, uh, you know, like working hard or being very honest or integrity or a bunch of these things that, you know, when I, it, it's just like, we were just very similar, uh, in, in those ways. Um, but I think like the other part of it was that I, you know, I just came into it where I was thinking, look, I won the jackpot. This is amazing. I don't know why this guy wants to co-found a company with me. This is, this is cool. Um, but you know, cause he, you know, he'd been there, done that, you know, sold a company before. Um, and this was my opportunity to really like learn all these things. Um, you know, learn a lot, um, for, from the get-go, but you know, on the flip side, 
um, as it related to like building the product, online marketing, and like all this kind of new age internet stuff. Like we were in the beginning of SaaS, right? So what's really interesting is I, I was looking at one of my like previous LinkedIn updates. I actually, like this is 2008. So I literally had on there my mission statement uh, as something like, I'm here to help the world transition from desktop software to internet-based applications. Like this is how, you know, like how wow. early we were in, in SaaS, relatively speaking. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it was like, we just came at it at different, um, you know, from, from different expertise and, and passion zones. And, and uh, we each respected uh, the other a lot and like let each person like do their thing. But we also, and this is really interesting, is like we actually talked a hundred times a day. Uh, we like we would love going, you know, and we would love like uh, traveling or like we wouldn't take a, a a flight to Toronto or something like that, and, and we would drive. Uh, but we would enjoy because like the whole car ride for you know four or five hours straight, we're we're just talking about the business and like different ideas and like how we should and debating things and. Um, you know, inside of like eight years, we probably argued maybe once, uh, right? Like it was just, wow, that's uh, yeah, it worked really, really well. Um, and I think like, I mean, a lot of the credit to go to Ellie, right? Like, I don't know. I mean, that's pretty uh, humble of him uh, to say, I'm going to be, you know, a co-founder with a, you know, like literally like a 22 year old. So I don't know yeah. that most people would do that. You know, a lot of the credit definitely goes but, to LA as well, but like, we're very close, right? Like we still, uh, even though like he's now running Mindbridge and I'm at fellow, uh, we still talk like once a week. Uh, yeah. so That's it's, neat. uh, one but of you the know, things what, what was, I, uh, obviously but, part of the story is, is him deciding I want to co-found a company with a 22 year old, but there's also you saying, I want to co-found a company with a guy who's in his fifties. And there are a lot of people who are 22 years old who don't want that experience, right? They don't want, they, they think, you know, I, I know way more about technology or I know way more about the future than some old guy who's the same age as my dad, right? That's the, that's the narrative around a lot of technology startups. And you were, you had the wisdom at that age to know you could learn a lot from this guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think like that is an important point. Um, and look, I had my fair share of like, uh, being very cocky and thinking I'm, I'm a know-it-all in, in a bunch of ways. Uh, the older you get, you realize that you actually don't know anything. So, um, but yeah, my, my philosophy is like, I can learn from everybody. There's something I can learn from everybody. Um, and, and I knew that like, I mean, and again, like it, from from the business side, like I might be passionate and I can go read a, a ton of books, but why wouldn't I want a shortcut um, and uh, work with someone who's actually done it, made a bunch of mistakes already? And I can just say like, hey, Ellie, how do we create a sales comp plan? Oh, okay, cool. Like this is the best way to do it. Great. Let's just run with that. Yeah. Right. So it's just- uh, Good for you. In my opinion, if you can pull it off, I recommend that everybody- co-found uh, you know all new grads co-found the company with with someone who's a lot more experienced like why wouldn't you yeah so what did you learn about becoming a leader because i know you know your your new company your newer company is is all about leadership and and working with your team and those kinds of things so what did you learn from that first experience about being a leader um you know, it, it's interesting. Like, uh, I mean, you know, anything I would have learned, I probably now kind of like uh, look uh, look back and learn about it. But I think that, you know, my, my biggest insight is that after you get to a certain number of people, uh, you literally, like, it's all about, it's always, always, it's always about the people. Uh, but you can, you can like through, it's, it is always about the people, but like you can get relatively far along having not really internalized that lesson. But after a certain point and a certain scale, you start to realize that, you know, there aren't enough hours in the day where you can kind of like pull, you know, have pull, pull, pull like the, the cart yourself. Like you, you actually need, uh, so at, at a certain point, like it's, 
it's effectively like the organization and, and the people and, and it just, your role changes. So leadership and, and management are like, you could build a company, but if you want to build, you know, a scale up or a meaningfully large company, it completely changes. And you just need to become, you just need to learn how to be a great manager and, and management and leadership are different. Um, and uh, you can, you can have inherent leadership capabilities, uh, but you know, being a manager, one of the one of the things we talk about at Fellow is, uh, you know, great managers are are made and and they're not born, uh, and that that's an important kind of lesson to to also learn. So just before we moved to Fellow, you you of course sold Fluidware to Survey Monkey. Um, was that was that a difficult decision, and what was that process and that transition like for you? I would say at the time it was not a difficult decision. Uh, you know, it was. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of great things, uh, great things about it. Uh, I think the difficulty came afterwards, uh, and it was like, oh, we just did this. What have we done? So there was definitely a moment of uh, of that. Um, but like no, remorse? look, it made sense. The um, you know, Survey Monkey was obviously like a super well known brand. We had an enterprise product. Uh, if we merged with them they wanted to get into the enterprise space. And so we still had just as much upside, except like our chances of succeeding were much higher because um, now we were together. And so if we had say 10 X upside from there together, we'd also have that 10 X upside. And, um, and, you know, it basically like, uh, so we weren't giving up much upside and we still had a lot of um, you know, like a lot of benefits from doing the transaction, but also there was another part of me, which was always curious about learning from people, um, you know, from, from Silicon Valley, uh, the, you know, late, well, uh, he, he passed away afterwards, but Dave Goldberg was kind of a legendary CEO. Uh, and, you know, he was the CEO of SurveyMonkey at the time. And, and I just thought the opportunity to be able to learn from him directly was really great. And they just had, a bunch of leaders. And so part of it was selfishly like, look at all the things and all the people I can learn from. This is, this is awesome. And they want to pay me too. And I can learn all these things, sign me up. So there's definitely part of it that did that. But I think like the, the major, uh, if anything, like you say, it was a difficult was, was afterwards because, uh, then you sell your company and you're like, Whoa. Uh, and when you're 22 and, and you start, you know, a company, and that's all you do day and night, seven days a week, nonstop, you forget that you actually have a life outside the company. So like my identity was the company and then we sold the company. And then it was like this existential, you know, uh, who, like, who am I if I sold my identity and my identity is the company. So definitely like the, the six months afterwards, uh, that was an interesting time to, to come to terms with what just, what did I just do? Uh, but you know, I like, would I do it again? hundred percent. Um, you know, I learned an insane amount and, uh, and, and I think it, it sets me up to, uh, you know, be where I am today working, working on fellow. So I think it was, is part of the, uh, it's definitely an important part of the journey. So let's talk about fellow. What was the driving force behind that? What's the, what was the problem you were trying to solve this time around? Yeah. So, uh, the, so here, here's kind of like, and this is my advice for entrepreneurs, although you should, before taking my advice, maybe wait, uh, another 10 years, uh, and, and, uh, and we can see the results at fellow, uh, and then decide whether you want to take it or not. But I, I would say that, you know, coming out of, uh, fluidware, fluidware was, you asked how we got into surveys. We, you know, we pivoted eight times. Uh, we just, we were, we were obsessed about business. We were going to find a, a thing that we were going to do. And we were just going to keep changing until we found the thing. Um, and so that was my, one of my lessons from Fluidware. So going into fellow, it was, okay, I'm going to spend six months and we're going to check out a bunch of ideas and whichever one is the least bad idea, we're just going to start that because at the end of the day, we're going to pivot anyway, right? Like I just had this mentality that like, once you start an idea and once you're doing things, you're going to learn some new things that you wouldn't have otherwise learned unless you started to do 
like actually started like really going after a particular idea. Um, our, our first idea was um, we just had this insight that as you know, really, you know, maybe I was 22 and, and my other two, the other two co-founders, uh, my, my brother, uh, Amin and Sam, uh, they were, you know, probably like 18 or 19 or whatever they were at the time. But they, um, we all like, this is, we didn't know very much about many of these fields. So we would use software so, to, to learn about a particular field. So if you use, say, a Salesforce, you'll learn some things about sales because you'll learn about leads and opportunities and funnels, and you'll start to understand the workflows that people employ um, for any particular discipline. Or if it's in marketing, like there's equivalent software tools. But one of the questions that we started asking was, where's the equivalent tool for managers? Like, how come there isn't software that people can use? By the way, software alone isn't going to make you a good manager. Just like Salesforce alone isn't going to make you a great salesperson. However, it can help you follow the workflows uh, that you know that are best in practice workflows, so that you could do those things more often. Uh, training alone doesn't create habit change. Training plus software, we believe, does. So that was the original idea. We wanted to build a man, what we call a manager's copilot. Um, and so that was the, the first foray. But then. Once we started getting into it, we just realized that managers spend um, most, like more than half of their time in meetings, um, and that was like, a, you know, you we might have like intellectually known that if you asked us, we could maybe answer that question, but we realized, wow, this is a really big problem, um, and nobody's doing anything about turning like meetings into productive work sessions. Uh, when you ask people about meetings, all they use are very negative words, like meetings are a waste of time. This meeting should have been an email. Uh, there's all these great memes on the internet. Are you lonely? Host a meeting. You know, it's, uh, so, but nobody had really been been looking at that. And so we started, we started fellow with, with the idea of building a manager's co-pilot and, and we started down that path. But somewhere in the middle, we realized that we do all these things for managers, um, but but the thing that uh, the thing that really needs like a lot of attention and love, and like it's a big problem, and it's a it's a universal problem. Every organized group of human beings on the world meets, and so uh, if we can actually tackle that, um, that will be a huge huge value add to all managers uh, and leaders out there. So uh, you know, today fellow is a what we like to call a meeting productivity and team management tool. Uh, we certainly lead with meeting productivity, but then we also have team management concepts uh, built in. And uh, yeah, that, that's kind of like where we started and, and where we are today. And so along the way, what have you learned about all those dynamics around management and leadership and meetings and and what that says about how productive or unproductive we are, how effective or ineffective we are, what, what have you picked up? Because you've been absorbed in this space now for a few years. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, learned, I've learned a lot. So what I would say on the, on the management side, um, you know, the, I mean, we, 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 we kind of talked about it before the show, but uh, we, we've invented this word at Fellow called super managers. Um, and, and to us, uh, and the reason we talk about super managers is because very often, and I think this is just a North American thing, uh, we, we think about individual contributors, we think about the star basketball player, we think about, uh, you know, the star surgeon, or uh, we, we think about like these, these heroic people that carry everybody and it's all, all about them. Um, but the reality is that it's, it's the team that does the work and and, and, and really deserves a credit. And, and the person that has the most impact on the team is, is the manager, right? Um, so we have this concept of like to us, um, you know, just like some people, call, there's this notion of 10X engineers. We think a super manager is a 10X manager, which means that through their involvement, that team will produce 10 times more impact than without their involvement, right? And uh, so that's our kind of like definition of this. And so what, what so is it I'm these... going to jump in, Aiden, just because yeah, I think ahead. that's a really important point, because there is sort of a, there's a, a default to kind of maligning managers as being 
you know, a necessary piece of the puzzle and, but, but often an obstacle and, and, and you're actually elevating managers to say a manager can be a huge difference maker in an organization, right? Yeah, they, 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 they absolutely should be. We talk about managers being the, the highest point of leverage, uh, for an organization. Um, and, you know, the, the view is that, yeah, we're, we champion managers and, and that's not a thing that was, uh, that was necessarily really done. And so at fellow, that's one of the things that we did. And, and so my biggest learning from, from all the different super managers that we've met and talked to and interviewed is that they all have one trait in common, uh, which is they're always constantly working on their craft. Uh, they're actively trying to become better managers. Uh, and that means like they're studying how they're spending their time. They're studying how they're doing their one-on-ones. They're studying like how often do the people that they hire get promoted. They're just like very particular, just like an athlete would like observe how they train and how you know they perform results. Like they're doing that just on, on like the people management side of things. And that's not everybody, right? Like that's, that's not all managers. Um, so that's what I've learned there. And on the meeting front, I mean, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to talk about there, but one of the things that managers do very often is, is, is obviously host meetings. Um, and I think like the, the most important thing is, and this is one of those stop, uh, take a step back and like ask these questions, um, is, uh, why are, what is the, what is the purpose of this meeting? Like really asking that question and like going through the effort of saying like, what is the outcome that we want in this meeting? Um, and like, what is this trying to achieve? And then asking questions of like, well, how do we constantly design this thing for it to work better? Just like people have software. So at fellow, and this is something that, that we encourage, um, is that, so first of all, uh, uh, no, no agenda, no meeting like that. That's a rule, right? No agenda, no meeting. Don't walk into a meeting without an agenda. So, that, so that's like, that's table six. So, um, but the second thing I would say is like iterate on those meetings. So we actually have version numbers internally. Uh, so for all the different meetings, we start with a certain version, uh, that we create and here's a template and like, here's what we're going to talk about. Here's how it's going to work and so on and so forth. And every so often we revisit and we modify the template and we're like version 0.2. Uh, and we actually upgrade the meeting. So all of our meetings are actually constantly getting better. And this goes back to that same concept of, you know, the best managers in the world, the super managers are always working on improving their craft. So if, if, if you even have a meeting that you haven't tweaked or made better it, it, in some period of time, that's a huge opportunity, right? And all these things matter because uh, this is one of, I mean, if you spend half of your time in these things, like how could you not be working on improving it all of the time? Yeah, that's a great point. So you are basically saying meetings are like software that managers use. and they Meetings have are to just keep, workflows. Yeah, like that's they what have they to are. Keep upgrading the upgrading the processes that they're using. Yeah. So, yeah. so this is, this is the I key, right? Like to relate all these things back together, meetings are just workflows, right? They're just a certain way of doing things. Um, and they have specific purposes and, and it is software. Like you said, it's, if, if I change your agenda, it changes the outcome of that meeting. It changes the workflow. And a lot of times, I mean, when you think about operating companies, a lot of people have what we call a meeting stack, right? Like what is the stack of or set of meetings that you have that you use to operate your company? Like you have your Q, QBRs and you have your weekly staff meeting and you have your monthly check-ins or your weekly project reviews. You have your one-on-ones and like each one of these things is, is a workflow that you run, right? And so, you know, the question is, and like our goal is to help the world meet better. And so we do that in, in two ways. Uh, so we'll do that in, we'll teach you how all these things work and we'll give you the templates and the workflows. And we also give you the software to make it easy uh, for you to follow those things. But you could just come and learn from us and learn from our content, which is all freely available and never use our software. We'll still be happy because uh, it furthers our mission and that works too. Mm, awesome.
I wanted to ask you what it's been like working with your brother all this time, because not everybody has that experience. You know, there are family businesses where it's just sort of automatic that you're going to work with your siblings because you're taking over the company that was run by your parents. But you guys chose to go into business together and you've chosen to kind of keep working together over the years. So what's what's that dynamic like? I mean, is one of the smartest people on the planet. I'd be dumb not to work with them. Uh, but you know, here's the thing, but we are brothers uh, and brothers argue, right? Like that's a, that's a thing that, that we do. You know, oddly enough, now that I think about it, the pandemic has been really, <laughs> we argue a lot less over, over, over Zoom and Google Meet, which is, <laughs> which is just super, super interesting. It's been um, good for your relationship. It's been <laughs> really good for the relationship. Uh, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Um, but no, I, I think like we've just, uh, we've just learned, um, we've just learned over the course of time uh, how to work with each other and like where to take each other's uh, opinion over certain things. And we've just, you know, and, and that's a thing that, that we've learned now. Now it's interesting. Um, there are many times like say uh, where, you know, in, in, in a pre, like in our previous company, we would have, um, you know, we didn't, we hadn't developed that skill yet of like, how do we actually, uh, work with each other. And like, we just happen to be, it's very interesting, but we just happen to like, even like different things. We both have opinions about everything, but you know, there are certain things that like, there's certain areas that he really enjoys and certain areas that I really enjoy. And it kind of works that we can each focus on the things that give us energy and the other person can handle, you know, the other side, uh, you know, it's, uh, it works, but, but again, uh, you have to work at it and then just build systems on, you know, how, how you resolve disagreements and, you know, how it works. We have this system. And I had this oddly enough with, uh, with Ellie as well. I mean, it's a very simple system, uh, which is like on a scale of one to 10, how important is this to you? Uh, and you can't say 10 every time, right? Cause it doesn't work that way. Uh, but if you're nine in terms of like how important this is for you, and I'm like a four, I'm not going to argue about it. We could do your way this time. That's cool. Uh, and but, uh, but you got to be honest. I've heard, I can't remember where I heard this, uh, but I heard someone else using this system as well. And, and, and the key is you have to be honest because otherwise you're just going to say 10 every time and you'll get your way. Right. Uh, so you have yeah. to, you have to say when it's a four or a three or a two. Yeah. And, you know, we're very, you know, we are very different, but, but in a lot of ways, we're, we're also uh, very similar. Um, and so we, we both can be stubborn and opinionated and so on and so forth. But the other thing is just like having a really healthy respect for the other person's domain. And, and this isn't just like a brother thing, right? This is just, you know, working with people in general, like you have to uh, let people like own a domain and, and, and run it. Um, so yeah, I think like that, that's what's, uh, what's really worked for us. And, but that's a really cool thing, right? Like if we look at it, if you count our, you know, from snow shoveling days to today, I mean, now you're talking about, I don't know, maybe close to 25 years, right? So it's, it, it's a long time, but even if you think about like our professional companies, so I mean, Sam and I, uh, the, the three of us, uh, this is our third company together. We've been working together for 15 years. We've built five products that have generated like tens of millions of dollars uh, in revenue. And so like, that's the other really important realization is it, just the team. I mean, I love this team. I mean, as long as they can tolerate me, like I'll keep working with them for, for forever and ever. But it's it's really hard to build a team, and and you see this in startup founders all the time. Like there's there's you know like this is a common reason why startups don't survive is like founder conflict. And if you again like if you find a team that you really work well with, uh, I mean I would try and stick with that team you know for eternity um, if you can. Um, you know if it, yeah. So I it, it's so funny like I I I just for fun I feel like at some point. Ellie and I should start a side hustle together, or it could be like a nonprofit or something, because it's just like fun working with people that you get along with. And so yeah. why not do more projects together? Yeah. What else is there in the end, right? Other than doing interesting things with people you like. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. 100% it. Like you have to like the people you work with. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Um, so I want to come back to your message about being irrationally optimistic. Tell me more about that. Why, 
irrationally optimistic specifically? Um, because like, if you just come uh, from, from, from a place of, um, because a lot of the things that happen in life are not like predictable or rational, like that's why, like all sorts of things. I mean, you can think about election outcomes. You can think about, you know, many, many different things that just like don't seem plausible. Right. Um, and I think like the, the problem is that if you, you know, if you start to, to bring logic into the equation, it's just like a different part of your brain uh, that gets triggered. And I think like there's um, for a lot of things for taking a lot of, I mean, look, starting a company is statistically a bad idea, right? Um, but if you, if you follow the statistics, it's, it's not going to, I mean, you'll never start. Uh, so I, I just think for, for a lot of things, it's, you just have to have this almost, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I mean, you can't, you, you have to consider reality. I'm not saying like, don't, yeah. you know, look at the reality, but, but you, you almost have to have this, uh, this ro rose colored view of the future of like what it could be. Um, and, uh, be able to do that without any, any constraints. Um, and then just like work towards that. Uh, so yeah, that, that's kind of my, and then there's this other, uh, you know, famous, uh, quote, uh, I used to have a, it's a funny, it's, Saw, saw this. I used to have a blog called uh, "Be Unreasonable." Uh, it was, you're always. This is a long time. It, it's been, you know, this blog hasn't existed for probably over a decade now. But it was. Um, but but the the word unreasonable comes from George Bernard Shaw, uh, who has a quote uh, that you know reasonable people. I, I forget the exact quote, but it you know it ends with like unreasonable people. Uh, you know, look, basically like adapt the world to themselves and therefore all progress depends on unreasonable people. And yeah, like to me, unreasonable, irrational, like th these are all part of the, the same family. And I just think that, you know, sometimes you need to, to be that way to do things that otherwise you, you wouldn't think are possible. Yeah. The reasonable person adapts himself or herself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself or herself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable person. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've gender neutralized his original quote there, but <laughs> yeah, no, he that's said good. man and himself, but I, I adapted it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good adaptation. But, <laughs> uh, but that's a great, yeah, that's a great message but but obviously there's a there's a i love that and i love I, i'm an optimist and i'm you know and and i i love that idea of being you know wild-eyed and, and all of that but there's some risk in that right and there are going to be people who will say well you know there are there are people who will follow that to a fault where they've mortgaged their house and they're you know they're expecting a business to pay off and there's no chance of that happening and and they should actually stop and do something else like so there is a flip side to that on some level right oh yeah i mean there there totally totally is I, you know i think like the uh best investors uh in the world um know that like you just have to cover your downside like this is kind of rule number 1 um which is like cover your downside know your risks, make, make sure you don't get wiped out. Like rule number one, basically it, it just comes down to, there's this, I mean, this is now we're going into investing, but it's not, it's not timing the market. It's time in the market. It's not, it's like, how many times can you show up at bat so that you can get lucky? Right. And so the thing is like, don't do anything where you'll get wiped out. Right. Um, so that you can keep trying and, and keep going forward. And you have to be uh, you know, don't keep doing the same things. Like look at the surrounding environments is it working is it not working. Change your approach. If you don't change your approach, that also doesn't work. Um, but I think like, it, it's just from a, no matter what situation you're in, there is always a way to solve it. And I don't know, like all the situations in the world, but I just think that that's a good framing to have. And if you have that yeah. framing, you'll, you'll tap a different part of your brain that may help you figure out like the right set of things you need to do to, to get to the other side. And I, I just think like, that's just like a good framing to have. I know, like, I know there's a solution. I just need to figure out what the solution is. Right. And, mm. and so that, you know, that, that's, that's kind of, uh, 
how, how I, where, where this thought process actually yeah. comes from. I love it. And I, I like what you just said there about, you know, you, you have to set yourself up to get as many at bats as possible to use a baseball metaphor, because if, you know, even if you're playing the odds and you only get one at bat, it may not turn out, right? Even if the odds are in your favor, it could still go against you. But you could be the world's best player and you could strike out for sure. Yeah, in, in the one at bat. But if you get enough at bats, then at some point you're going to hit a home run, right? That's the. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so also that's... like, a, you know, it's, it's also like a, a poker game, right? Like if you're, yeah. you're playing correctly in the long term, you'll win. Um, but it's, uh, yeah. And, and, and very similarly, like it, it's, it's also the same thing for, you know, investing in startups or, sure. uh, yeah. you, you might get any individual one wrong, but if you have the right process and you trust the process and like you optimize for being able to, uh, do this for a long time, um, it's, uh, you know, I, I think eventually, uh, yeah. it'll work out. And, and the thing is you just have to believe, right? Like part of this is if you don't believe, then you, you, you might not put in the, you know, you might not try. And so yeah. that's where this becomes super important. Great stuff. Aiden, this has been such a pleasure. I, I always learn so much whenever we talk and, and I, I love your perspective on so many things. Uh, you've, you've, had such a great journey so far and you're only just getting started. So uh, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. And good luck with everything you're doing. Thank you. Th thanks for having me on the show. That's Aiden Mirzai. I love that lesson about time in the market versus timing the market, about how it's getting as many at-bats as possible. And the fact that irrational optimism is the key to success as an entrepreneur and sticking with a team if it's working. So many great lessons there. So thank you again to Aiden Mirzai for joining us on Digging Deep. If you enjoyed this episode, please review it and share it with others. That will help us produce more great episodes of Digging Deep. And if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, you can see the show notes, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter, you can read my blog at letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. And get ready for more great stories and powerful lessons on the next edition of Digging Deep. Thank you for listening.